Okay, Mark, thank you very much. I am. I have spent the last year and a half on Zoom meetings. I mean, literally every day. And this is the first time I've had trouble with getting into a Zoom. And I, I don't know about anybody else. When when technology goes bad on me, I'm hopeless. I'm you know because I barely know enough to get on them. And, and if, if if I have to do anything unusual, I'm I'm, I'm way off. Anyway. I'm glad to be here. I'm happy to talk about, well, it was it was a book that came out about, what, a year and a half ago uh, called War Fever that I wrote with uh, Johnny Smith at Georgia Tech, who was a former student of mine, and we've now done three books together, and it's, it's, it's been a very fun collaboration, and if anybody's interested in that, I'd be happy to talk about it more um, when I get some questions. So the book is called War Fever. Boston baseball and America in the shadow of the great war. Okay. What did I, what, what were we trying to do? We're trying to tell essentially a war story, a world war one story, but we wanted to look at it from the perspective of three different people. Okay. So we, we, we feature three different people in this to tell some side of the war story their lives epitomize some side of the war story. Um, and, and they're all connected with Boston in some way. So it's a book about Boston in the war. It's a book about America in the war. It's a book, it's, it's a book about the multifaceted nature of the war. The three people we look at uh, in this book is our, our three celebrities. One person is a celebrity at the beginning of 1918 and becomes a super celebrity by the end of 1918. Another person is a celebrity at the beginning of 1918 and he's destroyed by, by the war. Uh, another person is, uh, not, is, is virtually unknown at the beginning of the year. And by the end of the year, he becomes the most famous at the time, most famous celebrity of, of World War I. The three people we look at is the celebrity who, who goes into celebrity stardom, super stratosphere, is Babe Ruth. The second person is a conductor for the Boston Symphony Orchestra called Carl Muck, Muck excuse me, who is a, a, a German, Swiss-born German, a bunch of different nationalities, conductor, one of the great world conductors, paid, brought by uh, Henry Lee Higginson to Boston, paid an extraordinary amount of money, $28,000 a year to conduct the Boston Public Symphony or Boston Symphony Orchestra. $28,000 a year. I know what you're saying to yourself. That doesn't sound too much. You know, what is that in today's dollars? In today's dollars, that's about five, about a half million dollars a year. That's a lot of money, a lot of money. Uh, and the last person we talk about, the soldier, is a guy by the name of Carl Whittlesey. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> Carl, Charles Whittlesey. Charles Whittlesey. Um, who becomes the leader of a, a, a unit called the Lost Battalion that gains immortal fame. He gains fame for something he never said. Supposedly, uh, not supposedly, the Germans asked him to surrender in this when they were trapped in this pocket uh, in the Mouzergon Offensive, and he supposedly said, go to hell. He never said, go to hell. He becomes known as go to hell Whittlesey. So he becomes famous not for what he really did, but what he really said, what he, what he didn't say. Okay, so these are the three people we're looking at. We're, we were also looking at uh, a fourth character that's not quite as developed as the other three, and that's this looming pandemic that's coming to uh, Boston and coming to America. Starts in America, comes back to America in 1918. Now, I know maybe what you're thinking, and certainly question a question that was been asked several times to me and to Johnny when we've done various appearances here and there, is did when we wrote this book, did we know that there was going to be another pandemic about 100 years later? Okay, the answer to that is no, absolutely not. Completely capricious. The book came out in March of, when did this pandemic start? Was it March of 2019? 
Uh, I think so. I think so. Not 2020. I've, uh, I've been in the in in this house for about the last year and a half. Um, but we the book literally came out the exact same month that the shutdown started in America. So it was uh, either really good timing or really awful timing. Uh, just at the time that people could not go into bookstores, the book came out. And of course, everybody that wanted to talk to us wanted to talk to Johnny and I, or, or interview us, or uh, feature us, uh, or reviews. What, what All they wanted to talk about was the pandemic and the comparison between 1918 and today. Um, and so it got some publicity, and thank goodness for, I guess, for Amazon.com. So that's the book. What I thought I would talk about a little today, if anybody's interested in listening, given the fact that... I am not a Cubs fan. I mean, I don't hate the Cubs, uh, but I'm not a huge Cubs fan, but I am a big Boston fan. And since the Red Sox are situated firmly ahead of the Yankees in first place uh, in their division, I thought I'd talk a little bit about Babe Ruth today. Um, who was Babe Ruth? Most of you know the story of Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth is a legendary figure. He, he might as well be Paul Bunyan, right? Uh, you know, this guy born in 1895 uh, in, in Baltimore, in a section of Baltimore called Pigtown. Okay, he's a rough kid. It's a rough section of town. It's a German section of town. Supposedly, Babe Ruth spoke German. Uh, I don't know how well he spoke German, but I've read reports that he would speak with Lou Gehrig's parents, who spoke only German. Okay, Lou G Gehrig, who's his teammate with the Yankees, and that Babe could handle himself pretty well in German. Certainly, he's he's a German American. His parents were German Americans. His family hails back from the old country of Germany or one of the regions of Germany, and and and. and which is interesting because he becomes a great hero during a war against Germany. Um, he, his parents, he's a tough kid, not very disciplined, got into trouble. His parents couldn't handle him. His mother was having a hard time. His father worked all virtually 24 hours a day in a bar in, in Pig Town. And they eventually put Babe Ruth in a, an orphanage slash reformatory. He never really learned any, he was only thinly brushed by the veneer of civilization. And uh, eventually um, he, he gets out of the school and he, the only thing he learned to do in, in, at St. Mary's was really play baseball and actually make callers on shirts. That, that's what he was trained to do. That was his, it, had, he, had there not been baseball, uh, he would have been an anonymous caller maker, I guess, or found some other activity less respectable. Um, in 1914, he had gone to Boston. Okay, so he goes, he's a pitcher, but, but, but a left-handed pitcher, maybe the best left-handed pitcher in baseball at that time. Not the best pitcher, but the best left-handed pitcher um, in baseball. And he, he, he goes at a time where baseball is played, the way it's played is what's called the dead ball era. And, and people didn't hit home runs back then. But when he was at St. Mary's, he came under the influence of a brother, Brother Matthias, who could hit the ball a mile with a fungo bat. And he, he was just legendary. He would throw one ball up in the air after the other and just belt the balls. And the balls would just go and go and, and they would drop from the sky. He would hit them one after another. It was like fireworks. It was just like, you know ashes, rain dropping down from the sky, and the kids would go crazy. And so Babe Ruth was just enamored by this uppercut swing and, and just hitting the ball as hard as he could. But this is a time where players played to win games one nothing, 2-1. to one. So the way you played is you choked way up on the bat, and you just tried to make contact with the ball. And, and the ball is hard to make contact with because the ball was usually dirty. It had spit on it. It had licorice on it. Anything you wanted to put on a baseball, you could do. Okay, you could really load it up, and it's hard to hit a ball. I mean, spit balls were completely legal. They, ra they rarely changed the ball during the game. So when a pitcher got the ball, the first thing he did 
was reach down, grab some dirt, rub dirt on it, make it as dark as possible, nick it on his belt a couple of times to make it so it was it was not completely round, and spit on it and throw these balls that came in at you, you know, like a butterfly. It was like trying to hit a hummingbird. So you 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 you, you really choke up. You just try to punch the ball. You try to get on the base. Maybe a walk. Maybe a a hit. And then you try to steal a base. You maybe a sacrifice to get you to third and somehow get you home. Okay, so it's a low ball. Nobody grabbed the bat down at the nub and sw- swung for the fences. Just didn't do it. Babe Ruth did it. Okay, so but consequently, he was a pitcher. He wasn't a hitter. Nobody thought, of the, you know, you don't let this crackpot try to hit a baseball like that. Okay, that brings us up to the Great War. Okay, uh, you can see batter up, Uncle Sam is at the plate. Uh, Harry Frazee, if you're a Boston fan, and Lord knows I hope there's a Boston fan out there. I, I, I can't think that there's a wouldn't be a Boston fan in that part of the country. Um, you know who Harry Frazee is. Harry Frazee is probably more infamous than famous in Boston. Carl Frazee is going to be the person who destroys the Red Sox by selling all the great players uh, after 1919, uh, mostly to the New York Yankees, including Babe Ruth and various a uh, number of other Boston players. Okay, we're now in 1917 and 1918. Um, the question is, is there going to be baseball? Okay, baseball players were not exempt from the draft. Okay, we're now in 1918, and we need, we think, millions of soldiers. This war is not over. Remember, the United States entered World War I in, uh, in the spring of 1917. We hadn't really done very much from then until early 1918. But we're, we're gearing up, and we need soldiers to send overseas. Okay, Frazee. His business is show business. He was an empresario of the theater in New York. He put on all kinds of famous plays, reviews in New York City. He bought Boston because it was an extension, the Red Sox, an extension of show business. And his attitude is the show must go on or I don't make money. And this certainly applied to making money off of Boston, okay, off of the Red Sox. But what happens if all the players are drafted? You know, this is this is a, a, a quandary that Frazee faced. Okay, Frazee's face, his his position was let's play the game in 1918. But the baseball owners had to be very, very careful about 1918, because what what, do they want to just appeal to the government and appeal to the American people and say, look, let's continue to play baseball. Let's give exemptions to all these baseball players. You know, uh, baseball players, are you kidding me? They're in their 20s, maybe early 30s. They're athletes. They're they're in great shape or they're supposed to be in great shape. They're stronger, faster, and, you know, physically just better than most American soldiers, dough boys being sent overseas. I one time saw some specifics, uh, heights and weight on dough boys, and I forget exactly what it was, but it was around, you know, five, six, five, seven, 130 pounds in around that. The average, the average dough boy was not a big guy. The average American was not a big guy. The baseball players, some of them are pretty large. So it, it would seem pitifully unpatriotic if baseball players were given a free pass from America's greatest fight. You know, so Jack Dempsey, I, I'm getting off the subject, but Jack Dempsey was tried as being a slacker after World War I because he didn't serve. You know, America's greatest fighter dodged America's greatest fight. So the owners knew that they couldn't come out publicly and say, let's play the game. But privately, they did. What they said is, look, let's turn baseball into a display of patriotism, okay? Just pure patriotism. You know, we'll play the game, but we'll do other things as well. 
Okay. Uh, for example, you know, we'll drill. You know, these guys are drilling with guns, but sometimes they just drill with bats if they didn't have enough guns. Uh, they just put their bats, and they ha would have a drill sergeant that would teach these players how to drill. And, you know, there were even competitions between teams, which teams could drill the best, as if, as if, you know, this drilling of players, teaching them how to drill, how to march, how to turn, how to about face, all that stuff. If they learn that, then, you know, they'd look like real soldiers. This is just a display of patriotism. They would uh, have war bond rallies at baseball games. They would allow wounded veterans or wounded soldiers and sailors in for free. They would... Uh, they would do everything that they could to link America with patriotism. It's in, during this year, particularly in the World Series, where the Star Spangled Banner begins to be played at baseball games. So here, this is what the owners are, are, are trying to do during this period of time. And that's, that's a good picture of them drilling. As I recall, I think Cleveland may have won the league-wide competition as the best drilled team. It's probably because they had rifles. I don't know. Okay, so this is what Frazier's doing. Publicly, publicly, behind the scenes, Frazee is lobbying Congress, not Congress, excuse me, lobbying politicians uh, as, as hard as he can. One of the politicians he lobbies at that time, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, man may look familiar with you, that FDR, if, 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 you're, if you're confused by, well, who is that? And that is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I'm just kidding you. I know everybody knows FDR. Okay. And, he, and, and Frazier writes FDR and he writes other people and he says, look, we've already lost 11, which they had, 11 players to the draft or to, they went to work in, in, in a defense plan or a war a tied industry of one short. He said, we've already lost 11 players. Could you protect the rest of our players so we can play the season? That's all I'm asking for. He asked, you know, major government officials. They all say, can't do it for you. You know, sorry, sorry. Can't, can't, can't do it for you. I'm, I'm thinking I love that. Who's Does anybody know that line? Can't, can't, can't do it for you. Uh, who was it? Uh, from the Godfather, who was the guy that uh, Tom can't do it for you, Tom can't can't get you out of it. Anyway, so this is Frazier. This is what's going on. But Frazier, Frazier is nothing if not a gambler. You know, most of the owners are saying, "Man, they're scratching their heads. They're worried. How are we going to make money? You know, if we don't play the leagues." And this is this is before the age of the billionaire owners. Okay, most of the owners are professional baseball teams, and it's not like the teams cost all that much. But most of them, they made their livelihood. They made their money off of playing. They had to pay for stadiums. I mean, they had to pay rent, and it, they had bills to pay. And they needed to play, but they're not sure. They're conservatives. Uh, Frazee is saying, no, okay, I lost a bunch of people. I'm going to buy a bunch of players. I'm going to buy a bunch of players from other teams, particularly the Philadelphia Athletics. Uh, they were willing to, Connie Mack was willing to sell anything. And you want to buy one of my players, buy one of my players. I mean, it, it was open market. He's, he's cutting payrolls. All owners are cutting payrolls. They're cutting the number of players that they have on the team. They're cutting salaries. They're, they're going down to the bare minimum. Okay, so this is a little bit of background on on what's going on in baseball at the time okay let's start the season okay the season starts you can't see that in spring training in hot springs arkansas okay hot springs arkansas and here we have babe ruth babe ruth pitching Look at that. that doesn't look like that Babe Ruth that you see with the Yankees with the big paunch, you know, kind of spindly legs running around. Maybe I'm sure if you any baseball fans, if you saw those wonderful uh, the documentary by Ken Burns on baseball and seen a million pictures of Babe Ruth, I'm sure you've seen that. Uh, but that, that's a, that's an athlete, Babe Ruth, who's still a kid, kid. And it's Babe Ruth hitting. And you know something? 
Babe Ruth was an influence. He, he was easily influenced. And Babe Ruth loved to hear people call his name. He loved being famous. He loved to hear people cheer for him. And when he pitched, and you know, at, at one time he held the, the, the record for scoreless innings in the World Series. I think it's been broken, but he held it for years and years, decades, decades, maybe close to a century. I don't know. Not that long. Uh, he, he loved it when he pitched and people would cheer. But man, they went crazy when he hit these long home runs. And he, he's they're using him as a batter more in spring training. And he's hitting the, the reports from Hot Springs were just wonderful. I loved reading them. There's one place they played in this one stadium where in right field, remember Babe Ruth is left-handed, so he's going to right field. Um, you know, over the fence was an alligator pond. And he was, they would report every time he hit a ball to the into the alligator pond, the, the pond. They thought that was just fantastic. And that cheering when he hit the long ball, uh, it just, just sent people crazy. And Babe Ruth just loved it. They thought this was great. Okay, so we got our scene. April, they're down in spring training. Then they're going to come back to start the season. Okay, we've got one of our main characters going. But something else is going on, too. Something else that the effects are felt down in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Okay, and what that is, is the great influenza outbreak. I don't know if you can read that at the top. Uh, I hope you can say it, but it, it says the great influenza outbreak begins. What is this all about? And probably but everybody knows this story by now, right? Someplace, you know, there's going to be a hell of a pandemic in 1918 into 1919. These, a series of waves. What happens? Okay. We think, and we don't know. Scientists don't know. I've read the scientific stuff on this, and I've read books on it, and nobody really knows. But it starts somewhere, right? It was it Wuhan, China? I don't, wasn't at that time. But there was a theory that it, maybe it was central China. And there was another theory that maybe it was someplace on the Western Front. But it seems to me the most convincing theory is that it starts out in Kansas, in Haskell County. Kansas in January of 1918, because we have evidence and we have reports coming from physicians, particularly a particular health physician at that time, that, you know, there's something serious that's going on out here in, in, in Haskell County. People are getting a flu. You know, they understood the flu. They understood influenza. And, and it's pretty bad. It's a pretty bad flu. You know, not as bad as it's going to be. But it's bad, and people are dying, not in huge numbers, but they're dying. And it spreads to a camp, one of the military camps. Now, there's military camps all over the country that were in a war. Of course, there's camps. There's new camps. And one of them out there was a place called Camp Funston. So you have all these soldiers at Camp Funston, and it, it's a perfect Petri dish, right? You have a bunch of soldiers. They're gathered together in close quarters, and gets coughing getting, going into the infirmary, getting sick. And then what do you do to those soldiers? You send them to camps all over the country. Okay, so you're, you're sending infected people that maybe are asymptomatic all around the country. And some of them end up in Fort Pike uh, in Arkansas, in Little Rock, outside of Little Rock. And then, of course, of course, uh, you, these people are going to infect people in Camp Pike. Uh, and who else do you have close to Camp Pike? You have the Boston Red Sox training. And suddenly some of those guys are getting sick. They're not dying. But I, the reports that uh, Johnny and I read, and I can remember reading them and finding them in newspapers, is they talked about a perfect epidemic, you know, a plague of the flu, 
you know, people are saying, you know, this is unusual. We're an, an unusual number of Red Sox are coming down with fevers and headaches and sore throats. They're not dying. They're getting better, but but they're coming down with some bad things. So st- just during spring training, during that spring of 1918, the flu comes down. Okay, so we have that. So we have those ingredients. What is is this a great picture? I hope you all can see the pictures. I hope my PowerPoint's working and everyone can see it. Can you see it, Betty? Shake your head yes if you can. Okay, I got some thumbs up. Okay, uh, it, yeah. So that's a wonderful picture of the Red Sox. Just a, look at Babe Ruth there. That's yeah. That's a just great picture. He still looks like a <laughs> kind of in a bad mood. Babe Ruth was a character. He 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 was he was a character, and I, I, I hope you read the book. There's got a bunch of good stories on Babe Ruth. Some of them new stories. Anyway, so this is this is Babe Ruth. The season begins. Okay, what happens in the season? Early in the season, Babe Ruth comes down with the flu. Okay, in May, early in the season, Babe Ruth he goes on May nineteenth, nineteen eighteen. To Revere Beach, okay, which was a, a beach outside of Boston, okay, and, and people would go. It was, a, it was a nice day. It was a warm day. Babe went, enjoyed himself, did what Babe did. He went with his wife, which wasn't always, he didn't always do that. He was often with somebody else. Uh, but Babe was with his wife at this time, and he ate God knows how many hot dogs, and he drank who knows how many soda pops and beer, and and and, and he played baseball in the sand with the kids, and he just had a really good time. Well, the next day, he, he, he woke up. He was supposed to pitch that day. He had a headache, had a 104-degree te- uh, fever. His chest ate. His throat was sore. I, he, he was sweaty. He had the chills. I mean, he had all the symptoms of a bad flu. Okay, they didn't know what it was, you know, they flew, but we better treat his throat. So they swabbed his throat. At that time, they would treat uh, a sore throat, a bad throat, uh, with silver nitrate, about a 10% solution, probably. And they swabbed it. The idea was to swab it to coat the throat with this solution. But you can't overdo it. Because if you overdo it, it can, you know, cause a const- it can cause a swelling in the throat and you won't be able to breathe and you can die. Well, the, evidently he was over swabbed because, because before he knew it, he started coughing, holding his throat, falls down to the ground, you know, rushed to the hospital. Rumors are that, you know, he, he, he may never be able to speak again. He may die. You know, and rumors are just ricocheting about, uh, you know, and nobody knows what to believe. Here we have a newspaper headline over here, Ruth in hospital and cannot speak a word. That must have hurt him. He liked to talk. There we can see him. He looks pretty bad. Uh, but, you know, he gets better. He gets better in a few days. I mean, he's out of the hospital a few days after that. He's back in playing baseball took a little bit of a while, but in May and June, in May and June, Babe Ruth hit, oh, get ready to fall out of your seats. He hits 11 home runs. Okay. Nobody had hit home. I'm yelling. I'm getting too excited. I'm sorry. Nobody hit home runs like that. 11 home runs. That's that, that is an incredible number of home runs. Um, so, as a matter of fact, 11 home runs, I think, in, in two months, were more home runs than eight teams, eight major league teams hit for the year, okay? I mean, this is, this is, this is record pace. That, nobody hit home runs like that. Now, important fact, in 1918, he'll lead the league, of course, in home runs. He doesn't hit any more home runs. He only hit 11. I think, and some other scholars think this, too, is that in the second half of the year, they were using very few baseballs and the baseballs were getting really soft and they were even the new balls they used, they think they were making them in a different way, winding them a little bit looser. And so the ball, instead of being hard and taking off like a rocket, was a little soft and took off like a softball and just didn't fly like the other ones did. But anyway, so Babe Ruth hits those 11 home runs 
And, and he becomes known as the Colossus. Oh, look at that picture of Babe. I mean, nobody could hit the ball like Babe did. And they, 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 they just loved it. This gives you some sense of the Colossus as a war hero. How is he affecting people? The story of Babe Ruth's mighty hitting, his Homeric smashes, kindles a glow in the hearts of all those, uh, all those who know baseball. Uh, in Italy, in Normandy, in Alsace, and in a hundred camps along the firing line, men meet and ask for the latest news of the gifted hitter of home runs. The story of each succeeding circuit cloud is received with acclaim. It lightens and it lightens what? Uh, okay. It, it lightens and breaks, oh yeah, the, the dangerous tension of, of a soldier's duty. And it's no stretch it's not stretching the point to say that in his own immutable way, the Colossus is contributing a worthwhile gift to the moral, uh, to the morale, I can't see that end, of Uncle Sam's fighting men both in the new and old world. He is, uh, he is the hero of all present day baseball. So it gives you a sense that this is something unusual. This is really, really unusual. Okay. Uh, what else do we have? And I, I, I know I'm probably going to go to, it seems like I'm going too long, but I got started late. So, uh, uh, if, 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 if I, if I go too long, somebody tell me to shut up and I will and just take questions. Okay. Here we go. Babe Ruth. The problem Babe's having after his throat gets better is with the manager. Okay. And I won't go into the manager, but the manager uh, of of the of, of Boston at that time, um, didn't like Babe Ruth hitting baseballs. Okay, he thought if you have a great pitcher, you use him exclusively as a pitcher. That a great pitcher in the dead ball era was more important than a hitter, particularly a hitter that struck out a fair amount of times. The idea of dead balls don't strike out. Get the ball down, get it on the ground. Maybe somebody will bumble it. Maybe we'll get to first base. You strike out, you're never going to get to first base. And Babe struck out a fair amount of times, but he hit the ball a long way. And so the manager didn't want to use Babe as a as a hitter as much as Babe. Babe doesn't want to pitch anymore. He wants to just hit. Why? The crowds go wild when he hits the long ball. So what? They go wild when he strikes out because he takes such huge swings at the ball. He twists himself into a course group. It's just cool to watch, okay? And Babe likes that. If he gets cheered for striking out, if he, if he gets cheered by the away crowds when he hits the long ball, that's great. That's fantastic. So Babe, you know, he's not sure but he wants to play for the manager. Okay. And there's a, in, in July, there's a chance these, he quits, he quit, he gets in a fight with the manager. He quits and he says, look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and play in one of the industrial leagues. You know, I'm going to play for the Bethlehem steel plant at this time. If you're a baseball player and your number was called, and you had to go to the war, you, you had a choice. You could enlist. You were kind of under what's called worker fight orders. So you could fight. You could enlist in the Army. You could be drafted into the Army. You could go overseas. You could be put in a trench in the Western Front. You could be engaged in the Moose Aragon Offensive that starts in uh, September of 1918. It's the last major offensive of World War I. You could do that, or you could go to work in a shipyard plant in a steel plant, those are all deferred. You could be a farmer too, but they, most of them weren't. Uh, you know, those are deferred jobs because they're need, necessary for the work, for, for the war. So it's work in one of these places or fight. Well, a lot of the baseball players, they didn't really particularly want to go overseas and you know, get killed in a trench. So they signed up to work at Bethlehem Steel, to work at Chester Shipyards, to work in Boston Shipyards. Uh, you know, they didn't really even work because all these industrial industries had their own baseball teams. And there was a shipyard league and there was an industrial league, a steel league. And, you know, so you, you could, if you're a professional baseball player, you could sign up. They would, they would hire you. You would have some job assigned to you, but you didn't do your job. You just played baseball. And 
They, and those leagues actually paid more than the major leagues. And so Babe Ruth threatened, because he couldn't hit, that he was going to play in one of the one of the industrial leagues. Well, he eventually didn't. The lawsuits were threatened, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so what do we have here? Okay, this is Newton Baker, uh, who was Secretary of War. Uh, and Newton Baker, you know, said, look, um, first, they, first they say here we have work or fight. First they say... Uh, no, no exemptions, baseball, you know, it's, we're going to take those players. Then there's a you and cry hubbub hubbub. And they say, okay, okay, here's what you can do. You can play until you can play until September. Okay, September at September 1st, all baseball players have to, they're under work or fight orders. They got to do one or the other. Okay, so you can basically finish the season. So in, in, in 1918, there's a shortened season. They, instead of 154 games, I think Boston played about 126, 129 games, something like that. You used to know that fact, but I kind of forgot it. Okay, and then they said, and two teams, two teams, as long as they're done by September 15th, they can play a World Series. Okay, between September 1st and September 15th, they can play a, a, a nine-game World Series. Okay, so we have that. Okay, so here we have American League champions, Boston. Uh, okay, so the World Series gets started. It's going to get started on uh, September on September um, 4th. It's going to be the first game. It's going to be, oh, oh, Mark, you're going to love this. It's going to be against the Cubs. It's going to be against your Cubs. Sorry about that. Um However, on August 27th, on August 27th at Commonwealth Pier, this is kind of a holding place for soldiers and sailors coming back to the United States or going out from the United States overseas. And on September 27th, for, for some, uh, there was a few people got sick. And we're taken to the sick bay, taken to the infirmary in this place with the flu, okay? And this is a different flu. The, the, the flu that we talked about uh, in spring had crossed America, had made a lot of people sick, had killed a number of people, but not an inordinate number that, that, that was too alarming. It had gone to Europe and it had mutated Okay, and then it came back. It 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 in late August it hits three different places. It hits in it, it outbreaks in Brest, France, which is a port town. People going in and out. Uh, it hit in Freetown, uh, Sierra Leone. Same thing. People coming from Europe, from Africa, it's a crossroads of the world, and it hits in Boston. Same thing. It's a port town. All people coming in and gone. This flu is bad okay people were getting it they were sick uh, immediately huge temperatures that suddenly for a lot of them they would they, they would have like blisters that would be purple their skin would turn bluish and they would die you know you might get up wake up in the morning feeling okay uh late morning you feel sick and by the night, you may be dead. Okay, this is the flu. And a third wave, this is the second wave, and you're going to have a third wave a little bit later that's going to kill about 675,000 Americans. Um, I, I've read so many reports of people turning blue and purple and egg fruit, uh, eggplant color. I, you know, and I'm not 100% sure why, but my guess is, it, it was, they didn't have respirators at that time. And so there was no way to get oxygen. These people were just oxygen deprived and your skin uh, will, will change colors. So this is, this is what's happening uh, at, in, in late August, okay, in Boston. And in, in the 4th of, uh, in, in, in the, on the 4th of September, the World Series starts. It starts in um, the first three games were played in Chicago. And there's a bombing in Chicago. It's a great time, uh, exciting time. First three games in, in, bought in Chicago uh, on the 4th, 5th, and 6th. Uh, and Boston goes up three to two, two to one, excuse me. Babe Ruth wins the game uh, pitching. And then it comes back 
They come back to Boston. They have one travel day, and then they play the last three games. It's a six-game series. Boston wins uh, four games, two, to win the World Series. Uh, but they play the other ones in Boston. It's during this time that the few people from Commonwealth Pier, within a few days, it's a, instead of one or two or three people, it's 150 people a day coming in sick, and then it's 200 people and 300 people. And before you know it, it spreads out of Commonwealth Pier into Boston. Okay. At this time, what's going on in Boston? There's parades, there's war fun rallies, there's draft rallies, there's these baseball games. People are mixing together, and this flu is spreading like wildfire. Uh, on September 11th, the last game of the series, uh, finally, William Woodward, who was one of the leading health officials at that time, says that this is spreading and we better start to do something about it. Okay, for, this is Red Sox will win the series, but there will be no, here we have Red Sox winning a series, but there's going to be no parades. By this time, Boston is under a shutdown order. Here we can see what, the, what it was like. The grip strikes Boston. Uh, and, and everything shut down. They, they understood the idea that you should probably sh social distance. People started wearing masks, too. There's baseball players, you can see, not in the World Series, but playing with masks on a little bit later. Um, so people ask me, how, how much did the flu affect baseball in 1918? My answer is really not very much, because by the time anybody knew about it or were warning people the series was almost over uh it, what affected baseball in 1918 was the work and fight order and the un instability of the government um but it, it certainly affected more than baseball it's it's going to affect other games you know it's, it's going to affect football games and boxing matches and hockey games and soccer games and 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 ice hockey, the Stanley Cup, they'll start the Stanley Cup in 1919, but players will start getting sick, and one of them will die, a famous one will die, and they'll suspend. They call it off the series, uh, the, the, the Stanley Cup, rather than continue to play it. Okay, and here, what do oh, we have? Okay, that's, uh, I'm out of my slides. Uh, you know, thank you very much. I tried to rush through this thing to get us done in some reasonable time. Mark, I don't know how long I took. I'm sorry I took if I took too long, but I think if we got started at the right time, I would have been fairly close. I'm sorry. I hope I didn't confuse anybody. That's my story. I'm happy to answer any questions on baseball. On 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 the other, believe me, the other stories are utterly fascinating. Uh, we'll see. You know, Whittlesey was so famous. And, and, you know, we just, in 1918, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Lost Battalion uh, trapped in this, this inhospitable pocket at the bottom of a ravine in, um, in, in the Meuse Aragon of France. And in 1918, on, on the day that they were relieved, on the days that they were trapped there, I actually spent my time in the Meuse Aragon, in the pocket, and, and you know, just traping around it and getting to know the pocket. And, 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 and uh, about the same time, uh, within five miles of the Meuse Aragon, where Whittlesey was, is where Sergeant York captured all the Germans and becomes, a, you know, he becomes the really the most famous uh, when they make the movie about him starring Gary Cooper. But anyway, and, and the story of Karl Muck and how he falls afoul of the United States government and ends up in an internment camp is, is, is equally important. So I just talked about one, one of the threads of the book and there's, there's many other threads, but anyway, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Um, um, on behalf of all Cub fans, we wanted to say that in 1918, we were just trying to be gracious uh, visitors because we knew a pandemic was coming. The, the Cubs could have won if it was a best of nine, but we figured it, 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 the, the flu was there. You know, we'll, 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 we'll wrap it up in six. We'll, we'll, I think everyone knew that. I, I, I think, that, I, was I, I think that goes without saying. Yes. Um, um, uh, thank you for doing this. I, 
um, one of the things that uh, that uh, that struck me because I I did read your book and and um, and again the, the I do recommend it because the three se semi intertwined threads because it's all in one really in in Boston you know with uh, with Mook with Ruth with Whittlesley. Um, I'm glad you brought up about the the worker fight order because in in a lot of ways it you know it, we're reading I'm reading your book and it's it's paralleling what's going on in 2020 2021 in 1918 the question became is, is baseball in this case specifically but was sports essential because it was a diversion and also the the patriotism versus xenophobia that was going on during the war and and um um talk about that because you know you, you, you mentioned that ruth uh, could speak german but some people didn't like him for that <laughs> you know that and obviously when talking about we can talk about carl mook in a little bit but um um the the question came up that these that was really necessary um for that worker fight you know that you you're not being patriotic if you're not doing your due your due duty here so um could you expand on that a little yeah i mean there's no question about it i mean you have kids from uh again you know young men but kids from all over america being sent to this war being drafted i mean there's a draft in 1917 1918 uh they're being sent overseas they're dying in in pretty appalling numbers considering uh not compared to maybe some later wars, uh, but it's a serious. And then to see these baseball players, number one, somehow staying out of the war, number two, making money, uh, you know, the, the, it, it creates a certain amount of hostility. In World War II, for example, uh, Roosevelt, early on, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who was a commissioner by that time, you know, sends this famous letter to Franklin Roosevelt and said, okay, you know, the war's broken out. What should we do? We don't want to be unpatriotic. Should we suspend baseball during the duration? And Roosevelt wrote back a letter, what's become known as a green light letter. And he says, no, continue to play baseball. It's a good diversion. Play more night games so shift workers can see you at, at different times. Uh, but there's going to be no exemptions, okay? So DiMaggio, Ted Williams, Hank Greenberg, you know, all the great players end up in the military. Now, some of them end up in, like, DiMaggio playing baseball in, on, on, in Hawaii. But, you know, some of them also end up fighting. Certainly Ted Williams was a pilot, was not and didn't see any active duty uh, overseas in World War II, but he did in Korea. Um, and, and, and so you have baseball players that suddenly are the ones with the flat feet that are 4F, they can't get into the military, of people like P.D. Gray with one arm. Uh, and so they played a game. It was a reduced game. It was an infer inferior game. But still, it was the game. The game was played. Uh, and so they, they tried to avoid some of the problems of World War I because there was, there was resentment, even though there were these patriotic displays. And, you know, I, I always say, or I think to, to people, they see baseball, they see football, and there's, a, there's this patriotic veneer to it. That starts really gets started in 1918 in baseball. I found it fascinating talking about uh, that era and you, you, I'm glad you mentioned about the, the month he hits 11 homers, but they, they're, they're essentially recycling baseballs. And if anybody knows that, you know, played softball, for example, that the, after you've hit the, the ball a few times, it gets soft and you're trying to use the same ball. It's not going as far. The, in your book, um, and again, you, you mentioned this at the top of your talk, it's really three characters all intertwined. And the story of Carl Mook, the the um, the conductor of the Boston Boston Symphony, yeah. is is really fascinating. Can you give a little synopsis for that for people that that don't know his story? Yes. Again, German. Remember, this is a time that was highly xenophobic. Okay, to be German was to was was to be a Hun, right? 
with all these posters of Germans portrayed as these Huns that do terrible things, you know, what they did in Belgium and France and all that. Uh, and, you know, if everything, if they renamed, sauerkraut was renamed Liberty Cabbage, okay, uh, Frankfurters were renamed Liber Liberty, uh, or Dachshunds were named, renamed Liberty Puppies, and, you know, this, if anything, the language of German was not taught in many high schools and colleges during World War I. Anything German was verboten. Uh, and they but you couldn't use verboten because the language was, uh, was not allowed. So we have this heightened xenophobia. Uh, and Karl Mork is German, okay? And he's, he's a conductor of the best orchestra in the United States. And they were playing, going to play, this is on October, of 1917, they're going to play a concert in Providence. What the Boston Symphony Orchestra did is they, they played concerts all around the United States, you know, off their season because they're in high demand. And there was a request, a late request, that they play the Star Spangled Banner before the con before the, the their concert. Well, this was passed on to the really the head of the guy by the name of uh, Henry Lee Higginson, uh, was passed on to him, and he made a decision. This is a kind of a, you know, Boston Brahmin, the, very opinionated, and he basically paid for the orchestra anyway. And he says, now, it doesn't really fit with the type of high art, high Brahms, Beethoven, those that we play. So he decides, no, okay. Carl Mook never knew anything about the request. It was never told to him. So Star Spangled's planner is not played. The next day, uh, a newspaper editor, editor from Providence, a guy by the name of Ratham, accuses Mook of being unpatriotic. Of course, he's German. He starts to, Ratham, who's just a rabble rouser, starts to accuse him of being a spy. And, and it, it, this thing just blows up. I mean, it's huge. It becomes an, a major, major story. Uh, and so suddenly the government starts to investigate uh, Mook. Maybe he's a spy. He was spent some time in the summer in, in uh, Maine. There were a lot of electronics things in the, in, in the place that he was in, you know, short wave radios and all that stuff. You know, the guy must be, you know, guiding German submarines to American targets. Anyway, it turns out that somebody had stayed there before, put those short waves in. Muck didn't know anything about them, never used them. Okay, it's, it's evident he is not a spy. But then they find letters from Muck. And what is evident is he had kind of a low opinion of Americans. He thought Americans were kind of this, a bastion of uh, a cultural wasteland, okay? And he, he had a friend who was one of the leading uh, diplomats in America, a guy by the name of Count Bernsdorf. Uh, he, was, uh, he knew the Kaiser. He was supposedly friends with the Kaiser. He had been the conductor in Berlin. And so, you know, He's not a spy, but he's pretty critical of America. And then they find these letters, love letters, and they find out that not a, he may not have been a spy, but he was a serial adulterer, that's for sure. And, you know, that he was involved with these various women. And so it, they get kind of government gives them a choice. Either you go to an internment camp in Chattanooga for the war or all your secrets are going to be out. And so he ends up going to Chattanooga and spending the rest of the war in an internment camp. It wasn't terrible, but, you know, it's, it's not what he was used to. And it kind of breaks him. His wife, Anita, was extraordinarily loyal to him, stayed with him. So his story becomes really an interesting story. That's probably more than you want. I'm sorry, Mark. <laughs> no, that's fine. No, it didn't. In fact, it's like kind of the original uh, um, fake news, if you will, because uh, supposedly the the the, uh, the editor for the Providence paper demanded that he play the the, the Star Spangled Banner, and he never got the letter. Because, like, no. what are you talking about? <laughs> exactly. Now, the letter Higginson had the letter, but Higginson used no. We're not going to play it. But they did agree before before the symphony orchestra broke up. They did agree that they would play the national anthem at all their concerts after that. 
Uh, and and we, we, well, I won't tell you what happens to Ratham or some of the other characters, uh, but it's 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 a good story. Yeah, it's it, it's worth checking out. And Whittlesley, the the third one, is the most enigmatic, I think, even for you, because there wasn't there wasn't a lot to go on it seems you know that you 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 found out what you could find out but he was he kind of remains a cipher throughout the whole book is that fair to say no i think it's very fair uh we're talking about a person that never wanted to be a hero never wanted to be famous ne 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 never really wanted to be known he was a nice guy people liked him he never married. He lived in a boarding house. He was a Wall Street lawyer. Uh, you know, he liked going to football games. He, he went to Williams College and Harvard Law School. He was an excellent student. He was a scholar. He was a socialist for part of his life, left the Socialist Party because he was extraordinarily patriotic. And he believed Whittlesey's had fought in every American battle since the Pequot War back in the 1600s. And, uh, you know, he... And he ends up becoming a hero, and he doesn't want to be a hero. He, you know, he 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 just wants to go back to anonymity. I mean, very rarely do you see a person like this who's such a reluctant hero. And the things he saw, he spent this, you know, almost close to a week in this pocket being shelled by Ger shot by Germans he goes into the pocket with with some 700 excuse me about 900 people about battalion sized force and he, less than 200 people were able to walk out when they're finally rescued i mean it's a harrowing story what happened and he has to relive it Okay, since he was the commander, he would get letters from wives, from mothers, from girlfriends. You know, how did my wife, husband, brother, whatever, how did he die? What is he going to say? Hey, they were shot, gangrene set in, you know, he, he died three days later screaming with dysentery. No, you know, everybody died well. You know, they died fast. It was a heroic death. But it made him relive what happened. And it was, it was debilitating. I'll leave you with this question. Uh, you started with, and um, and we talked about Babe Ruth. As you were writing about Babe Ruth, and obviously he's almost this larger than life character, regardless if you're a sports fan or not, you know who Babe Ruth is. Did you did you find yourself liking him, not liking him? What was what was your emotional tug and pull to to be George Herman Ruth? Yeah, he wasn't German. He was, he was Babe, not so much George Herman anymore. I'm not German, I'm Babe. And we've heard that before. Um, it's impossible not to. Babe Ruth was so irrepressible. Uh, he was such a, in, in one way, you hate to say it, but he was such an innocent um, that he, for as crude as he was, for, uh, you know, he famously, when he was in the Yankee, he, uh, he, he spiked one person going to first base or one of the bases. And, uh, you know, he apologized. He, he, he didn't, it wasn't a try. And when he got back to the dugout, he said, hey, who's that new guy? And it was a guy he'd been playing with for like 10 years. He didn't even recognize know his name. I mean, somebody like Babe Ruth, who's just so... What word do you use for him? You know, such a a force of nature. Uh, it was impossible not to like. I mean, he, he was crude. He was, he, but he, there there's something uniquely American about him. Well, I want to thank you for um, um, being a good sport. You, you you overcame sore throat. You overcame technology. You you. Uh, um we, you, you made it through so uh so well, the, name of the, <laughs> the name of the book is war fever um his name is randy roberts um thank you for doing this tonight i really appreciate it thank you everybody for being good sports and we had to we had to move some things around but i think we we, we muddled through it <laughs> so, okay so, well i appreciate it i appreciate thank you, Dr. it roberts yeah thank right. you and thank anybody out there listening. I appreciate it. And thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for doing this. Adios.